Best Book Bits podcast brings you Alan Heyman, a leadership and executive coach specializing in helping his fellow introverts find their superpowers and working in with leaders in transition through his practice, Peaceful Direction, and the author of Don't Just Have the Soup, 52 Analogies for Leadership, Coaching, and Life. Alan, thank you for being on the podcast. Michael, thank you so much for having me. It's great to join you from all the way across yeah, the globe. Yeah, no worries. Well, down under, down here, and up top where you are. Uh, for my owners who don't know who you are, take us back to the early 90s and um, working in TV, anchor, newsman, um, on the road. Uh, yeah, let's go back. What was that like? So I was in local news for a brief period of time. It was an aspiration of mine probably since childhood. I went to journalism school. I worked uh, in local news in my native Illinois, both behind the scenes as on camera for a few years uh, before making my way out to the D.C. area to try something entirely different with my career. So I've had a few pivots and a few turns over the course of the uh, the journey for, for 25 plus years. Uh, but I think my <clears throat> starting days as a journalist were pretty foundational in terms of my outlook on work. Uh, and also, I think a lot of the lessons that I learned back then uh, really do inform my work today as an executive coach as yeah, well. Yeah, your professional career really, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge and really fascinates me as well. So, yeah, apart from sort of being a, uh, a field producer and, and a bureau chief at the TV, uh, you're co founder and managing one of DC's first co-op working environments. Can you expand on that a little bit about uh, and what that was about? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. You know, you, you, you take a, a few kids in their early 20s having a little business adventure early in their, uh, you know, careers. And uh, I suppose that if we had had uh, the benefit of newer technology that became available later on uh, and maybe some sharper minds, we would have had uh, a pretty explosive concept on our hands because, you know, there, there are businesses of that nature that have done quite well since then. Uh, but we were a small group of people. And in addition to the real estate aspect of it, I think what was really important about what we were doing was the connections among people. So uh, there were small firms all around the space that we had built. They were doing projects together. There were a few relationships and even a marriage that had formed as a result of the uh, the relationships that came between the people in that space, uh, which was which was lovely, even though the concept didn't survive, uh, you know, but a few years of life. Yeah, no, cool. And uh, some of the lessons you learned working for government of the District Columbia for five years. Uh, what are some of the stories oh, or sure. experiences or lessons you learned uh, working for the government? Absolutely. So I learned a lot about the pace of change uh, and the pace of change in government can vary depending on what level of government and what your capacity is. So if you're elected as a change maker and if you're elected to drive, you know, a, a recalcitrant bureaucracy into the future and, and make it be more responsive, uh, to the needs of its constituents, you're operating at a whole different level as somebody who's maybe been working in the same job for 20, 30, or 40 years and really craves stability and, and knowing that things are going to be pretty much similar from day to day to day. So I learned a lot about those tensions and how they operate. And I also just had the privilege of working with some of the sharpest minds in, in local government at the time that I was there, many of whom I'm still connected to. So that was uh, that was a terrific experience and very foundational. You work in local government, you get to learn a lot about a lot of different things, you know, from trash collection and recycling to environmental protection, to public health, to education. Uh, so I, I think that my two careers in journalism and in local government were almost like grad school in a way for me uh, before I actually did grad school. And that was that was fantastic. Yeah, you're also uh, a lawyer as well, but you decided not to pursue that path. Is that correct? Uh, one of the things that I have learned more about myself over time is how I'm wired and where I work best. And one of the earliest lessons I picked up in law school was I do not have the temperament of a litigator. And uh, some of my closest friends in law school went on to become extremely successful litigators and have different temperaments to mine. So I like the kind of interactions and engagements where everybody gets a little bit of something out of the experience rather than this adversarial, you know, go crush the other side type of mentality that's required for litigation, which which we need. We need to have successful litigators who do that. Uh, it's just kind of not the way that I'm oriented to the world. So my favorite classes in law school were alternative dispute resolution, negotiation, mediation, uh, the type of things where, you know, there, there's almost a, a both and uh, to the equation. And uh, really just also met some fascinating people along the way uh, going to law school at night as I did. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, I myself can understand temperament and, uh, yeah, who, who wants to be a, a litigator and dominate? But for some people, that's uh, that's what they do. And we definitely need people like that as well. Um, talk about a little bit your time at DC Water and the Humane Society of uh, United States uh, before we jump into sort of some of the other things you do with leadership coaching. Sure. So communications and marketing is my background. As you know, I went to journalism school. So I kind of bounced around different different government agencies and nonprofits here in, in the D.C. United States area before coming into coaching. So you name just a few of the places that I was uh, you know, able to work and led some teams of folks doing some pretty impressive stakeholder engagement communications work. Uh, even uh, extending out to fundraising in, in the nonprofits where I've worked. So uh, the bottom line is, I, I think having conversations with people has always been part of what I do for a living. Uh, helping leaders emerge has been part of what I do for a living for, for a very long time and storytelling as well. And there are elements of all of those things in coaching. And so one of the things that makes me uh, look forward to doing my job every day when I get up in the morning and come down to my home office is the ability to pull together those threads of different things I've done throughout the course of my career that I really enjoy uh, in a single job, which to me feels more like an expression of myself than anything else I've, I've done for a living in 25 plus years. Yeah, I can relate uh, being a coach myself and it's, it's nice to, you know, as you said, pulling the threads from your from not just your previous experience, but things in your subconscious mind and using the stories and analogies that come out as well. So yeah, really, really exciting. So um, talked about a little bit about leadership coaching. Uh, you were the president of Blue Drop. Uh, what is Blue Drop? And then how did that move into sort of uh, peaceful direction through there? So Blue Drop is a spinoff of DC Water. It's a nonprofit that is actually wholly owned by a government agency. And we started that to market the various products and services that DC Water invented over the course of its own work to constituents beyond just the local community. So the idea was that other utilities, other companies might find these things useful and you can get more mileage out of the investment that way. So we did a small amount of consulting work when we first started the, the company, and that's not something that the company is now doing anymore. Uh, but in doing that, I started to get a feel for what client needs are. I started doing a little bit of coaching while I was in coaching school as part of uh, my training at Blue Drop. And also I had the experience, the recent experience of starting a brand new small business, which came in really, really handy when it was time for me to start my brand new small business of my own, which is Peaceful Direction. So I had a sense of, you know, how do you get your paperwork filed with various government entities that need to approve the starting of a company? How do you do bookkeeping? How do you keep track of your time? All these things that I learned along the way uh, with my team over there at Blue Drop came in very, very useful when I started the company that I'm now running. Yeah, no, really, really nice. And yeah, we'll, we'll get into some of your uh, experience with coaching and uh, mastering leadership as well. Um, talk about how the book sort of came about. What was the idea about it? And um, yeah, when when did you launch it? Absolutely. So I think that one of the uh, skills that has emerged over the course of my career is pattern recognition. So I can kind of spot when patterns are emerging in my life. And one of the patterns that I started to notice was that analogies were creeping their way into an awful lot of my coaching sessions. And these were analogies that uh, my clients would come up with as we were discussing. They were analogies that sometimes a fellow coach would throw in. And there were analogies that would just come into my own brain on the fly as we were engaging you know, a client and I. And so I started to write a few of them down because they seemed fairly useful. And the clients could really relate to them. They brought things into terms that the client would understand. And I started a little bit of a collection. And I thought, okay, let's do a blog post or two and see how these are received outside of the coaching session themselves. So what, what do you do? You take out all the identifying information. You make sure it's completely anonymous and confidential because that's what coaching is. And you put it out there. So I had a few blog posts in my you know, collection of analogies. They seemed to do fairly well. People were responding to them. Oh, you know, that makes sense. And I had something similar to that happen in my own life. And occasionally people would even respond with analogies of their own. And so I started uh, you know, around the spring of 2021 or so thinking, if I could grab 52 of these, if I could grab one of these for every week of the calendar year, that might make an interesting anthology. Maybe we could assemble these things together into a little book. So that was the plan. 
And I asked my wife, who's a talented artist and an art teacher, if she'd be willing to consider illustrating these, doing an illustration for each one. She said yes, much to my delight, because we had never worked on anything professionally together before. And so as I was writing, she was illustrating, and we just kind of tag teamed in getting this thing, did the bulk of the work over a summer when she wasn't teaching, uh, and turned it in and got it up and running and into the hands of... Uh, you know, the, the rest of the world in November of 2021. Awesome. Yeah, it's a great book and uh, I've read the book and it's, you know, for coaching, leadership and life as well. Uh, we'll, we'll deep dive into the topics. You you organize, you organize the book around six topics, which are the leadership mindset, communication, time and attention, relationship transitions um, and coaching as well. So first off, what gave you the idea for the book title? Uh, so the book title came from one of the analogies itself that you can actually read in the book. And I had a few possibilities for the title. There were a few analogies that stood out as these were among my favorites when I was writing them, or the title just seemed kind of off the wall, unusual, and, and you know, pretty memorable. <clears throat> this one in particular came from a nonprofit client that I was coaching, and she was very frustrated one day because she couldn't uh, get traction with some of her staff in terms of them carrying out her instructions. And she couldn't figure out why that was. Was it that she... Um, had the wrong people in the job, that they weren't capable? Was there some sort of gap in understanding? And we eventually arrived at the idea that she was not making herself heard as clearly as she could, and therefore the instructions were not conveying. And to get there, I asked her to conjure in her mind the image of going to a nice restaurant and ordering a meal, perhaps with a friend, and choosing among the various things that come with a meal from time to time at a nice restaurant. So you say, okay, thanks, I'll, I'll have the salad, that's great, thank you very much. And then a few minutes later, somebody comes out of the kitchen with a bowl of minestrone and places it on the table in front of you and asks you if you want the, you know, the fresh ground pepper. Uh, and you have a choice to make at that moment. And you can say, I'm sorry, actually what I did order was the salad, would you mind you know, bringing me what I ordered, please? Or would you say to yourself, you know, uh, soup takes a lot of work. Somebody had to take the trouble to make this back in the kitchen and, you know, mix it up and simmer it for a few hours. And they had to pour it in a bowl, you know, and bring it to the table. And that probably was some trouble too. And I don't want to waste it. So I'll, I'll just have the soup. And she kind of paused for a moment and backed up. And then she smiled and she said, you know, I would absolutely do that. And I hate soup. So that was where the analogy of the soup was born. And it was in the collection, and I was thinking about it as a possible title, that along with a couple others. And the designer I was working with on the cover had to have me give him some artwork because it's actually a picture of a fork and a napkin from my kitchen that you're seeing on the cover of the book. And it wasn't in the right format. He couldn't use what I sent. And so he said to me one morning, he said, Alan, you know, I was gonna just accept the soup, but as it turns out, what I actually need is this in this format with this dimensions. Can you please give me that and we'll make the best cover that we can. And I thought to myself, if, you know, if pre-publication, somebody is already quoting one of my analogies back to me as part of the design process, that's probably a fairly good title. And it's also pretty memorable. So that's what we went with. And that is how we have the title, Don't Just Have the Soup. Yeah, cool story. And I think it's a good analogy for anything in life. Um, Sometimes we don't communicate correctly about what we want or what we need and we sort of get back mediocre and a lot of people just accept mediocre because they don't want confrontation. But yeah, we, we should be returning yeah. the soup and, and getting what we actually ask for and you can use that analogy and we'll jump in to some of the stories and analogies you use. But I think that's a good, uh, it's a good quote, you know, don't. Don't take the soup, um, you know, demand, demand more from life as well and communicate effectively too. But jumping into sort of section number yes. one in the book, which is the, the leader mindset, um, answer me this, why is it so important to coach the entire client from the body and spirit to the mind? Uh, can you expand on that a little bit about coaching the entire client? In your leadership career. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think if there's much that the pandemic has taught us, uh, one of the first lessons is that uh, we need to be thinking about ourselves as entire human beings. And I think this started right around the time that a lot of the knowledge workers were forced to start working from home for the first time, you know, maybe even in environments where that wasn't uh, respected or even allowed. And so we started to see all of these uh, 
you know, home related things among our coworkers, you know, work portfolios. So we would see mm-hmm. guest bedrooms and we would see, uh, you know, family members and pets and uh, perhaps piles of laundry and things of that nature. Things that we probably knew or suspected all of our coworkers had, but we're seeing them for the first time. And I think what that did was that gave us permission to start talking and thinking about ourselves as whole humans rather than just employees or units of production. And that's kind of the same way that I see coaching. So a leader can't separate these various aspects of their lives and only bring some of them into the coaching session. So if you coach somebody, and and you know this because you've been doing this work for, for quite a while as well, you know, they're slumped over in their chair, kind of looking a little dejected, which is a total contrast from the way that you usually find them in a session, you got to ask about that. You got to probe into it a little bit because it's probably illustrative of something not only that they might want to talk about with you, but something that they're bringing into the rest of their work as well. So I, you know, unlike, let's say, the medical profession where, you know, specialty is dedicated to treating individual parts, you know, the the hand, ear, nose and throat, the feet, the you know, digestive system. Uh, coaching is holistic. We, we take the entire human being because there's there's no way to separate out those parts when you're when you're doing the work. Yeah, thank you for expanding that. And yeah, I think what COVID did, uh, it was bring the private life into the public life. You know, people working from home and all of a sudden you've got to put your camera on. People can see your environment, maybe some kids running around in the background. They're like, oh, you know what? This, this person is human. And we go to work with these masks on, okay? And then we know we're, we're wearing the, the mask of the work mask, but everyone then has got the, the, the family mask or the private mask. There's a Japanese quote that says, we wear three masks. It's one mask we show the world. Uh, the second mask is who we show sort of our friends and family. And then that third mask is who we don't show anyone. And that's our true self uh, behind, behind the mask mm-hmm. as well. So yeah, thank you for explaining that with, uh, with COVID and how the private life came into the public life. Um, you talk about the leader mindset in the book, and I'll just touch on them. some of your superpowers, which is self-awareness, uh, presence, and resilience. They're all important and they're all learnable skills. Can you expand on the, uh, the leader mindset? Absolutely. It's it's the thing that separates leaders from, from everybody else, and it's something that is evolving and changing. And some of the best leaders that I worked with uh, throughout my own career were constantly in this growth mode and adaptation mode because they recognized that the world around them was changing and they needed to change along with it. I think if you get into that fixed mindset and you're stuck, uh, it's going to cause problems in your leadership and eventually some frictions with you know your team or your organization. So developing the leader mindset and growing the leader mindset is is the work, work of coaching. And it, it includes those three elements of self-awareness and presence uh, that you mentioned. Uh, but there's a whole lot to it beyond that. And I think what's interesting to me lately in my work is that I spend as much time talking with leaders about what they need to embrace as I do talking with them about what they might want to consider leaving behind. So... A lot of leadership, I think, and the leader mindset is an act of omission as much as it is of commission, where you are constantly making decisions about what to deprioritize, what to ignore, what to care less about. Because if you don't, you're not going to have time and energy and space for the actual agenda that you need to accomplish in your job as a leader. And part of that has to do with balancing people's demands and concerns of you and telling people no from time to time. Uh, And part of it means staking out enough space for yourself in terms of your schedule, in terms of your awareness, in terms of your uh, being for what's actually important to you. So I do a lot of work with leaders on that as well, especially uh, the leaders who, you know, similar to myself, perhaps in the past have been the recovering people pleasers who don't like to say no. That's that's a skill that, you know, can be built up and nurtured. Yeah. And some of the notes I took from that, you, you talk about sort of uh, embrace or leave behind. What, what do you what do you mean by that? Um, so I've had the good fortune in my career of being the generalist among the specialists. I was always the communications guy among the brilliant experts in whatever field or whatever organization I happened to be working around. And my job was to translate or lead the team of people who translated that brilliant work into general language that, you know, non-experts can understand and embrace. So I was sort of the middleware in between the expert and the general public. And what that taught me was the expertise is extremely important to the people who have it. It becomes almost a personal brand. 
So if you are the genius lawyer, architect, engineer, clinician, scientist, at some point within a large organization, you will possibly get promoted into leadership and you will be leading the teams of people who are brilliant or intended to be brilliant at that thing that you once did. So your task at that moment is to start the process of letting that thing go. That thing that was part of your identity, part of your skill set, part of your calling card is no longer going to be crucial to your success, even though it's what, you, what got you there in the first place. And you have to be comfortable leaving that behind. You have to be comfortable leading and nurturing teams of people who are ultimately going to get better at that thing than you once were. And I have seen this be the case across multiple industries, across private sector, public sector, across uh, different types of occupations. It's, it's almost a universal thing. So letting go of that prior identity as the doer is key to being the leader, and it, it, it can trip people up sometimes. It's, it's pretty tricky, and I've, I've been there myself, so yeah, I know. Thanks for expanding. Uh, it makes uh, complete sense. Sometimes we need to sort of let go and of not just the ego, but just the attachments to what we think external things make us uh, internal, and it's, that's the reason why we need coaches and people to, to look at the label, uh, which we can't when we're inside the box. Uh, but yeah, moving on, um, you give a cool analogy about uh, a leadership super suit. What is a, a leadership yes. super suit? Oh, yes. So uh, my daughter's about to turn 13, and as a result of uh, having a fun young person of that age in the house, uh, we watch you know all the animated movies and love many of them. So this one comes from The Incredibles, where there's a bunch of superheroes who come in different sizes and different ages. And, you know, in, in the sequel, one of them's even a baby. And everybody's got to have their own super suit because it's custom tailored to not only what they're capable of, whether it's great strength or elasticity or fire, uh, but what they need to protect themselves against. So my, my thing with this analogy is that I think the leadership super suit, the thing that you put on when you go in every morning to your leadership role, whether you're remote or going into an office, has to be customized for you. It can't be this you know scratchy, formal, uncomfortable, ill-fitting, off-the-rack thing because it's not going to be authentic. So to me, that is taking stock of the elements of yourself that are useful in a leadership context that you can reflect out well, that will serve the people you have to serve and building that into the persona that you carry around as a leader. That's your super suit. And it is, as I say, completely custom built for the person who wears it to the point where you feel like it's, you know, kind of a part of you rather than something that you have to, you know, put on physically when you when you start the job at the yeah, day. Yeah, really nice. Not yeah, I think a lot of people can relate to uh, putting on the the leadership super suit, but also taking it off uh, at times as well. Like, you know, switching down gears when you get home instead of being in sort of the fourth and fifth gear of work, 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 and I'm the leader, I'm the business guy. But to take the suit off as well and to understand that we are the human uh, behind the suit uh, and we're not a superhero um, sometimes at home because your dog doesn't care what you do yeah. for work; he's just happy that you're home. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, some of the other things you talk about in the book, it's securing your own mask uh, before helping others. Uh, you take the importance of self-care as a leader. Uh, what are some ways that we can do this and some tips you can give leaders to, um, yeah, put the mask on before putting it on others? Uh, and entire books have been written on this topic, and some of them are, are amazing. They're on the shelf right behind me and probably behind you. Uh, and I would say, you know, the process starts with recognizing the need. So... Yes, we live in a Western kind of individual, me first kind of culture. And at the same time, leaders who have multiple responsibilities and multiple stakeholders who are you know, practicing the servant leader model uh, often have a habit of putting themselves last, of not taking care of their own needs. And to me, it is foundational and it is an act of leadership to address your personal needs and your personal care as a leader for a number of different reasons. One, we don't need our leaders to be burned out and exhausted and not thinking clearly. They're not effective if, the, if that is the case. And two, think about everything that we do as leaders as a model for the behavior of the teams of people we lead. So if we are not taking our PTO and it's going unused at the end of the calendar year because it was just too busy, if we are sending emails in the middle of the night, if we are responding to messages while we're on vacation and supposed to be recharging, all the people who work for us are gonna do the same thing, which is not a recipe for sustainability in a modern world. You have to rest, you have to recover, you have to recharge, you have to take care of your home and your family, the people who depend on you, your pets and your personal health. Otherwise, your effectiveness as a leader will be temporary. 
You cannot run, you know, 100 miles an hour all day, every single day. Even, you know, the, the finest crafted machines on the earth need downtime, need repair, need uh, maintenance. And leaders are, are, are no different than that. We have to take time off. We have to take a break. And one of the very first questions that led me to this that I asked with one of my earliest clients was, OK, I want you to think about in what ways this upcoming vacation you're going to take is actually an act of leadership. Because it is. You got to take the time. Yeah, yeah. You t- some of the notes I took. You talk about sort of rest, recharge, recover. We we can't be at our best until we're in a state of you know rest, recharge. Like we're not gonna we're not gonna be good or effective leaders if we're burnt out, worn out. You know, ne- we need to take the car in for service. That, as, as you said, leadership. Uh, sometimes going on vacation, it could be an active leadership thing. You know, putting your car in for service once a year. We need to do that with ourselves as well, and 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 take a break uh, so we can come back better, well oiled, well greased, new tires. Um, you know, yeah. There's so many analogies that we can that we can use as well. Um, some of the analogies you use in the book, uh, coaching with your leaders from from the past, from your years of uh, coaching, you talk about cutting the grass themselves. What do you mean by cutting the grass themselves? What's that analogy about? Yes. So this was not mine. It's used by permission from a great coach named Scott Eblen, who wrote a book called The Next Level, which is still a go-to, you know, even 10 plus years later. So definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, This is the idea that as you climb in leadership and as you take on escalating responsibilities, the work gets less tangible. So the story is of somebody who maybe started cutting grass in high school just for a little bit of extra money, you know, on the side on weekends and eventually ended up owning a chain of successful landscaping businesses. And you don't have that smell of fresh cut grass on your boots anymore. And you probably miss it because your days are concerned with real estate and leases and employee agreements and maintenance contracts and finance and things of that nature. And so you have to consider what you're giving up on your way up to the top. And if the most important thing to you is that tangible thing, I made something with my hands today. I made something happen physically today. You're not going to get that sense of satisfaction out of a job at that level. Uh, Once upon a time, I had a job where uh, on average, I would have 45 to 50 meetings in a week in my office. And I would go home a lot of days from that job thinking to myself, what exactly did I do today? What tangible impact did I have on the world today? You know, how many lawns did I cut, let's say? Uh, And it was very unclear. So you have to develop ways of being comfortable that the impact that you're delivering is through other people. And it can be a huge impact. Think about how many lawns you can get cut by owning a multi-state landscaping service rather than pushing the lawnmower yourself for eight hours a day or 10 or 12 hours. Huge impact but it's indirect and it's less tangible. So you, you, you know, you've got to get your head around that as the transition is happening. Uh, and that is something that a coach uh, can do a great service in helping you with. Yeah, it's a great analogy and uh, I, I can really use that in my own life as well. But the, the opposite's true too. I, I enjoy cutting the grass as much as anyone from a, a, a private level so I could turn off that analytical mind and switched off into another gear so yeah unless but i understand what you're saying with sometimes especially at work stop doing the 20 dollars an hour job where if you're getting paid 250 dollars an hour stop doing the you know the 10 to 20 dollars an hour jobs and and outsource that as well Moving on in the book, uh, section right. number two, you talk about communication. And one of the great little analogies I found in there was the 30, 60, 90% design concept. What is the 30, 60, 90% design concept analogy? Absolutely. So as I said earlier, I'm not an engineer, but this is something that's fully in the engineering realm that I got to know a little bit during my days in municipal government. So this is the idea that a project will be completed in its design in different phases, and you gather different input from your public and from other stakeholders based on what stage of the design you're at. So let's say you're building a new bridge over the river. At 30%, you're taking all kinds of commentary from the public about 
you know, what it's going to look like, maybe, you know, how many bike lanes it's going to have in addition to the traffic lanes or what the streetlights are going to look like as they go all the way across it. Or, you know, uh, would it even be feasible to have this thing open and closed so that tall boats can get through underneath it? That's, you know, those very basic preliminary kind of questions. And by the time you get it all the way to 90, it's it's the finishing touches. It's the brickwork. It's the, you know, paint colors for, you know, the the mechanic, the, the stuff underneath it. So the analogy here in leadership is to know what stage of a project you're at and also to be comfortable putting things out there for feedback when they're less fully formed. So think about your idea at 30% versus at 60 or 90. And I think there's this temptation on the part of a lot of leaders and a lot of people in business to have it all figured out before they even open their mouths, to have some certainty, to have some sense that it's, you know, a, a fully formed idea. It's less risky that way, it seems. So if you think about it at 30 and you think about it in an idea that, that is general, but also very malleable, that could really benefit from some input from other people, you might be interested in considering uh, putting it out there a little bit sooner versus you could imagine what would happen in a community, let's say, if the engineers and the elected officials and the transportation uh, folks all got together and they did all this work behind the scenes and they didn't bring the bridge out to meet the public until it was 90 percent designed. People would have some opinions and they'd be a little frustrated by not being able to express them sooner. It's a it's a great analogy. And um yeah, I, I, I really like it. It makes uh, a lot of sense, and you can see you can see why they do what they do, and and why uh, feedback is important at the start, but why feedback is not important at the end once you, once you're ninety percent. Um, moving on to another analogy, you talk about the donut in the hole, and I'm sure a lot of people know this analogy with sort of what you focus on. Are you focusing on the donut or are you focusing on the hole? But what what's your take on this analogy, the donut in the hole? Yeah, I, I came to learn that both are important, and so. Uh, doing some work in a fast moving startup, uh, not long ago, uh, I do have a tendency at times to troubleshoot. I do have a tendency at times to share my opinion on parts of the experience that could be working better. Mm -hmm. And so the idea here is that that's the whole, and that's something that is absolutely necessary for organizations to be focused on, especially when, uh, you know, leaders can be surrounded by bubbles of people who are often telling them things that they might think they want to hear as opposed to need to hear. So there, there's a little bit of a speaking truth element to this. There's a little bit of a troubleshooting element of this. And it it, it need not be, you know, malicious or, or ill-tempered or anything of that, uh, you know, of that sort. But it's just, you know, it's it's a constructive feedback that, that will help make a process or a product or an organization better. And sometimes you have to look for it because if you're surrounded by this constant seeming culture of positivity, the donut, the sweet part, uh, you might miss some of the things that are actually not going on. In yeah, the great analogy. I really like that one. And the last uh, analogy before we move on to section number three. So with section number two, communication, you talk about the misdirected airplane. Can you expand on this analogy, the yeah. misdirected airplane? Yeah, you know, misdirected airplane and, and the soup actually have some similarities in terms of uh, where we ended up with these. So the idea is that it's it's a little bit of a science to figure out how much direction to give your folks at the beginning of a project and how often to check in with them. Because if you do it too much, then you're micromanaging, you're doing the work for them. And to your point earlier, you're doing that $20 an hour work when you're getting paid the 250. It's not a good use of time and resources. And it also doesn't give your team any room to be creative, to do what they do best, to learn, to grow. So you don't wanna clamp it down too hard. At the same time, if you give unclear instructions at the beginning, or if you just vanish during the process entirely, odds are likely you're going to get something at the end that doesn't resemble what you want. So the analogy here is that if two planes take off, you know, roughly around the same time and to the naked eye, they're headed in exactly the same direction, but one of them is maybe 10 degrees off course compared to the other one. After a few hours of flying time, that one plane is gonna be hundreds of miles away from where the first plane ended up. And if they were both supposed to go to the same place, that's kind of gonna be a problem for the people who were on the plane. And it wouldn't happen that way because we have modern navigation. And if the navigation for some reason fails, pilots know how to direct their planes properly. But you need to do that as the leader too. So you need to set the direction extremely clearly at the very beginning of the project or the process, get them pointed in the right direction, make sure all the planes are taking off oriented the same. And then you check in from time to time to make sure that they're on course. And then that's all you have to do. 
then you don't end up in that scenario where you're at the end and you're like, this is not what I wanted. You should have understood me better. I, I thought I, I gave a clear example at the beginning and just kind of set you off on your own course. Yeah, and some of the notes I took from that was, you know, you're not providing turn by turn directions. You're you're setting the course and making sure right. everyone's staying on it. So, um, yeah, great analogy through there. Jumping through section number three, you talk about time and attention, and you know, as a leader, uh, time and attention are the most uh, precious resources. You give a great analogy, and I'm sure everyone's heard of this one. If not. The sand, pebbles, and rocks. The analogy was made popular by Stephen Covey in uh, two of his best-selling books, um, but we're not still sure on the original uh, author of it. But can you expand on that, talking about time and attention, precious resources, sand, pebbles, and rocks? Yes, uh, too much sand and not enough room for the big rocks is, I guess, how I would start that. So, you know, you imagine a display on a table, you've got three different piles of material. One is fairly large rocks, one is pebbles or gravel, and the other is sand, and there's a jar. And they will all only fit into the jar one way. And that is if you start with the big rocks, then you put in the gravel, and then you pour the sand in the middle to kind of fill up the cracks. If you start with the sand, you will end the process and not have enough room for your big rocks. So the idea here is that in, in 2022, you know, in, in this particular planet, in this particular place, there's so much sand. Everything is competing for our attention. And we can, you know, scroll the feed one more time if we feel like we're getting a little itchy and waiting too long in the grocery store for our turn in line. But what is that doing to our ability to pay attention when we really need to? In my view, and this has been my own experience even in the last couple of years myself, is it is, it is shattering our attention into a million little pieces. And some of this is by design because there's great profit to be made in our distractions with all these apps and notifications and various things that we need to keep track of. Uh, and some of it is, is honestly well intended to help us communicate and do business better, but just adds to the clutter and the distraction that's out there. So my thing is, if you don't make room for your big rocks, you're not going to be able to fit them into your schedule and fit them into your workload. So what I have been doing of late uh, for that is that I find if something takes me more than a half hour to do, I'm going to schedule it because otherwise I will not sit down and do that thing in the half hour that I have in between coaching sessions or, you know, the hour that's left in my day after this podcast interview is over. I need to actually make room for the big rock. Otherwise, there's not, you know, there's not a chance that it's going to happen well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for expanding. And one of the things you said, if it's so you said if it takes longer than 30 minutes, you'll schedule it. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things I interviewed yeah. David Allen, who's the master of productivity with the 80-20 rule, he said, if anything can take in less than two minutes, do it. Meaning there's so much you can, if you work in two minute, if you spend your work life in two minute increments, you can get so much done in those small little things. But going back to the big rocks, definitely we need to sit down and work out what are those big rocks in, in your life? What, what are those things that actually matter? Back to the 80-20 rule, you're only five hours out of 24 hours is going to be productive. So what are those five hours in a day? What are you? What are those big rocks you're actually working on that when your head hits the pillow at night, you can go, you know what? Yes, there was a lot of sand, there was a lot of pebbles, but I did work on the big rocks. You were chiseling at the big rock every day instead of you know, moving sand. And as you said before, with one of the analogies of having 40 to 50 meetings a day when back in one of your career days, that you were just dealing with a lot of sand and pebbles and you and you're like did i even touch the rock today you know there was no there was no big yeah. rock so yeah great and now i really i really love that analogy and if you haven't go to youtube yeah. and type in that as well you can actually watch the experiment where i think stephen covey yes. does it as well um god rest his soul he actually died by falling off falling off a a, a bike uh like a, a just a, a normal mountain bike. He fell and hit his head and he died. So anyway, um, God bless Stephen Covey. Moving on, moving on. You talk about the 50 pound weight on your back. One of the analogies I love in the book. Can you talk about that where you and your wife were sort of running the, the 10K uh, marathon and you had to put your daughter on your shoulders? Is that correct? Yeah, it's absolutely true. Uh, it was years ago at this point. I wouldn't be able to do that with a 13 year old because I'm older and not as strong and she's a lot bigger than she once was. But yeah, our daughter was five or six at the time, and my wife and I had been scheduled to do this this 10K race in, in D.C., and the babysitter canceled because she got sick. And all of the other folks that we would have asked at the very last minute for that were in the race. And, you know, you can't just tell the five-year-old, okay, stand here and we'll be back in, you know, an hour or two. That's not really how it works. It's not responsible parenting in the United States. Uh, so 
we just decided to give it a go. And I, I hoisted my daughter up on my shoulders and ran the entire 10 kilometers that way. Uh, we finished, I think, maybe second and third to last uh, in, in the race. And she did get down and run, you know, through the finish line for the last few paces on her own two feet. But it was it was a great experience. And we have photos and uh, just a nice family adventure that we were not anticipating. And of course, it, it ended up fueling this analogy in the book of uh, life in COVID time, especially for, you know, the working moms out there having to shoulder the burden suddenly of in-house child care or education in the early days when the schools and the daycare centers were closed. And I had a client who was dealing with this and she was lamenting her loss of productivity. And I said, look, I, I get it. And nobody expects you to have to do this for the rest of your life. This is, we hope, temporary. Uh, and also, uh, think about what it's like when that weight is finally lifted, how much stronger, how much faster you're going to be for having had that experience. Uh, come to find out that, you know, in the end, after not terribly long time, her, her kids did go back to daycare and to school. And it wasn't, you know, everybody constantly around her uh, in the house. So she did start to experience that freedom and that productivity again. But look, a lot of folks didn't. In the United States, many, many people, including women, did drop out of the workforce during COVID because of reasons like that. And the child care never came back or the job was lost. And, um, I think that's the sort of thing that affects us at a societal and structural level that is not fair to ask the individual to carry. So I would almost analogize that to a larger than 50 pound weight that you need other people to help you, you know, keep aloft if you're going to, you know, keep going. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And yeah, it makes, yeah, COVID really um, did that to a lot of people and it's still going on and it's definitely not over and the, and the ramifications of that are, are still going. Um, I want to get through some more analogies, obviously, before we run out of time as well, and we'll sort of go through a bit of a, a speed one. Uh, I like the analogy of the presidential laundry about delegating more. What is presidential laundry? Uh, that was a good one. Yes. So th this is similar to what we were talking about earlier with, you know, highest and best use of your time. Uh, my daughter comes into these a lot. And as it turns out, she was outraged a few years ago when she learned that the president doesn't have to do his own laundry. Uh, we know as leaders and as, as adults why that's not a good use of his time and attention. And so I ask my clients from time to time if they are doing their own laundry or if there's somebody else who can actually you know staff that for them. Yeah, really cool. Uh, the other one I like was uh, you're, you're not a bus. You don't have to let uh, everybody on. You want to expand on that? Yes. Had a lawyer who was a client uh, who had a professor tell her that in law school. And uh, the idea is that it's OK to say no from time to time. And in fact, it might actually be beneficial. So depending on who your stakeholders are and what kind of job you're in, this can be either useful or hazardous or some combination of both. But it is not necessary to automatically assume you should do something just because somebody asked you to. No is a complete sentence. Yeah, no, that was, was really cool. I like that. And, and you're right. Like you don't have to. It's your... It's, you're driving your car, not a bus. You don't have to let everyone off. You don't have to stop when someone waves you down. You can literally drive your own car and, and, and move on. Um, what's, the, what's the analogy of the river or the pool? Uh, this, you talk about sort of your leadership roles in 45 to 50 meetings a, a week. Uh, yeah, talk about the river or the pool. What's that one about? So I ask my clients from time to time to consider the element of choice and the element of agency. How much of this is actually totally beyond your control, like a force of nature as a river? So if your schedule is a river and you're just sort of like trying to dive in and keep up with the current, that's one situation. But if it's more like a pool, it's still something that contains water. It is human created. It is tranquil. It is there for your own use and your own enjoyment. Could it be that your schedule is actually more like the pool and less like the river? If you take a deep look at it, if you ask yourself, are these meetings that I really need to be attending or am I just going because somebody invited me? So that's that's the task there is to figure out what the role of your schedule is and how much control over it you actually have. Yeah, and uh, segueing that into a, a free swim, you talk about the book about the Google's 20% time and, and the adult version of a free swim. What's that about? Gave us the post-it note after all, didn't it, at 3M? So uh, this is the idea that there has to be something to keep people engaged when they're doing uh technical repetitive work. I, I had somebody who was managing engineers and he couldn't get the person to focus on the task that was actually required. So I wondered about, you know, giving the guy a little bit of free swim at the end of the day. If you finish what you're assigned to do, 
Go off, explore, create, ideate, have adventures, do things that are different, which will not only keep you interested in the job, but might actually yield some impressive results for the company at the same time. Uh, I think the person I was coaching hadn't considered that he could do both of those things to let the person explore and also continue doing what uh, was required and that those might be, you know, intertwined yeah. somehow. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up with sort of section four and five. So section four, you talk about relationships. So I can go into a million analogies. But yeah, you tell me what, what's, um, what's section four relationships about in the book or how would you unpack that? Well, you know, I think the more that we rise in leadership, the more our work actually consists of engaging in relationships rather than performing tasks. So that section is all about how to look at those relationships differently, how to consider the needs of different stakeholders and how to navigate the complexity of it. Because look, uh, it can be a lot easier and a lot simpler sometimes to move numbers around on a spreadsheet or to, to make things on a machine or to you know, cut the grass, to go back to our, our earlier analogy rather than, you know, all these complexities and all the different things from our personal backgrounds and our identities that we bring into our work life. Very complicated type of stuff that you can work very well with. Uh, yeah, I like up. what you said there. You said uh, managing relationships instead of tasks. The higher you go up the ladder, yeah, the, the more you're sort of managing those those interpersonal relationships with other managers to get the job done, but you're not sort of managing tasks. Yeah, really, really great analogy. Um, and section five, you talk about transitions, obviously going through what happened with COVID. Yeah, talk a, a little bit about uh, some of your clients or some of your knowledge on, on transitions and um, how how you can sort of help people transition. Um, I know you've got a lot of analogies in the book on that. Yes, and I have been coaching through a lot of transitions lately, in fact. So uh, I speak with folks about what they might, might want to take with them from one you know, work experience to another, what they might want to leave behind. There are analogies on that in the book, uh, as well as how do you prepare? How do you get your mind ready for a career change or a new role or a different city or even a retirement? Uh, these are things that I've been working with coach, uh, coaching clients on a lot for probably the last six months to a year, just because it is sort of the... Uh, the idea of the moment is a lot of folks have had the chance to consider what's really important to them, uh, things that they want to keep doing for a long, long time at work and things that they'd rather never do again. And uh, I think one of the other great lessons the pandemic has taught us is that we have choices, we have options. Uh, there are things that we can approach that maybe we wouldn't have considered before that are within our reach yeah. now. And, and last sort of section 60, go through coaching. Talk about reframing and the importance of a coach to, you know, uh, show clients that they can look through a new lens and, and see things a different way, uh, reframing. It's one of the number one benefits of working with a coach rather than trying to do your leadership development on your own. We can help you see things differently. We can help you examine what is going on in your life from a different angle, from a different perspective, turn it upside down, flip it sideways. And as the disinterested observer, as the person who's probably less familiar with your industry, not to mention your day-to-day -day work, uh, we can bring that outside perspective and either hold up a mirror or hold up a lens to help you see that situation somewhat differently. And a change in perspective is often the first thing that you need to start the series of changes that will give you more effectiveness and leadership. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you for unpacking that. And uh, I think we'll sort of uh, wrap it there as well. So um, for more audience out there, uh, where can they find more about yourself, Alan, and where can they buy the book? Is it the website or is it on Amazon or what's the best place? All the above. So if you visit my website at peacefuldirection.com, there's a link to the book. You can buy it wherever uh, major books are sold around the world. And there's uh, an electronic version of it as well. So if you rather read it on a device, that is that is an option that's available. Yeah, that's too. awesome. And if people want to follow you socially, where do you sort of more socially hang out? Is it LinkedIn, Instagram, or what's the what's the best place that people can find you socially? Yeah, I would say LinkedIn often and Twitter once yeah, in a cool. while. Yeah, same. No problem. So for my audience out there, um, yeah, thank you, Alan, for being a great guest on the podcast. Go out there, purchase the books, the book, Don't Just Have the Soup, uh, Don't Just Have the Soup by Alan Heyman. So thank you, Alan, for being a great guest on the Best Book Beats podcast. And is there any other books or anything you're working on in the future that uh, that's going to come out? Always working on something. Uh, I will say not all of the analogies I had made the book uh, and they're still springing forth in coaching sessions. So there might be something else on that at some point down the line, but too early to make commitments on that just sort of thing. Just a segue, just a quick, uh, th that's one of the reasons why I love coaching is because I say things that I've never ever said before and I unpack things from my subconscious mind that all of a sudden I'm just like, shit, did I just say that? And it's like literally you just wrote another book with, 
um, with some of the quotes. But anyway, yeah, as a fellow coach to a coach here, I can understand the analogies that come out through coaching sessions. So I know there'll be another book out in the future with newer analogies that your subconscious mind will make up as well. But anyway, Alan, thank you for being a guest on the Best Book Bit podcast and we'll catch up soon. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Michael. Really great to spend time with you.